Okay. Welcome to She Opened the Door, Ask the Expert. I'm Cassandra Ziegler, graduate of Teachers College 2017, and also soon to be graduate of SEPA, and co-chair of the She Opened the Door Leadership Committee. So this series features Columbia alumni speaking about their experiences, challenges, and achievements in an interactive setting with audiences from across the globe. We're thrilled to be back for a second year after an exceptional inaugural year uh, in which we welcomed eight experts to the She Opened the Door screen. So now I am very, very excited to introduce to you today our extraordinary guest, sisters Alicia Sarani, 2013 Barnard College, and Isabella Sarani, 2016 Barnard College. Alicia is a lawyer and social entrepreneur, starting her career in investment banking at RBS and Morgan Stanley. She got a law degree while launching several new ventures spanning art, politics, artificial intelligence, and fashion. Currently, Alicia is CEO of sustainable fashion brand Twin, that's what I need, and COO of pro-democracy organization NEA. As a lawyer and graduate of Barnard College, Oxford University, and Fordham Law School, her previous roles have included COO of New Hive, a multimedia publishing platform for creatives with over 10 million users, and COO of Guardians.ai, investigating the impact of misinformation on corporate and public businesses and individuals using the Twitter API. Her work has been read into the congressional record and featured in the New York Times, Vogue, Teen Vogue, Bloomberg, and BuzzFeed. Now, Isabella is also the co-founder, designer, and creative director of the fashion brand Twin, a sustainable, radically inclusive company that spans race, gender, size, and ableism through broader representation and thoughtful design. She graduated from Barnard with a BA in art history and started her career in the arts in the Tino Siegel piece, this progress at the Guggenheim, which is recognized by complex media as one of the 50 most iconic artworks. She continued her work in the art world at the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Met College Group, the Williams Society, and then at the Apollo Circle, organizing educational and fundraising events. Subsequently, Isabella gravitated towards brand building in the fashion industry for companies like Elite World Group, Misha Nunu, Liberty of London, Full Booty Bands, and Canada. Canada Goose, to name a few. As an activist, Isabella has created projects from hashtag Get Behind Us, featured in Teen Vogue, Elle, Bustle, and more, to Masks for the Masses, featured in Vice. She's also been featured in the New York Times and Vogue. So as a reminder, this is an interactive discussion. So near the end of today's conversation, we will have an open Q&A. Throughout the discussion, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question, and we will get to it during the discussion section. All right. Well, Alicia and Isabella, welcome. I am so, so pleased to have you here um, as friends, as our first guests for year two of Ask the Expert. Um, we have had many conversations. And so I know that the audience today is in for a really special treat. Um, so I think, you know, we'll we'll start off the way we, we do with all of these as the expert uh, discussions, which is how about you tell us a little bit, you know, about where you started, your time at Columbia as a student, and perhaps how your time at Columbia played a role in getting you to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, firstly, thank you so much for having us and also just being an incredible friend. I mean, it's amazing that you came to us through Twin. So it's so fitting that we're here today talking to the Columbia community about Twin. Um, so first and foremost, Isabella and I are twin sisters. Um, the reason it's worth pointing out is because as anyone with eyeballs can see, we don't look anything alike. Absolutely nothing. So um, one of the fun things about TWIN, which I think is not super obvious at first, is that it's actually an acronym that stands for That's What I Need. 
And partially that was because we are disappointing twins. Um, but it's also, you know, just a general kind of promise that we make as a brand. But how we all started in New York and how we ultimately met Cass is by going to Barnard College. Um, we my, both went. We both went. So despite being bad twins, we obviously like had the same choice in excellent, mm -hmm. excellent choice actually in university. Um, but yeah, my journey at Barnard, I would say is pretty typical Barnard. Um, I'm, we're both like very gung-ho Barnard students. I came in thinking I was going to study philosophy. That's exactly what I did. I was philosophy, political science, double major. Um, I had incredible mentors like Dorothy Denberg, who guided me into um, kind of continuing to pursue all of the things that I was interested in as a freshman throughout my time at school. Um, and also, you know, for I, I would say like my path was very linear, like everything I thought I was going to do, like I wanted to study abroad at Oxford or Cambridge. I did it. I went to Oxford. I kind of hoped I was going to row. I wrote at Columbia and I wrote at Oxford. And then, you know, kind of what you were saying about my background is like post Barnard, I would say everything was quite kind of expected, you know, like a classic Barnard girl goes off to work at investment bank. And then from that point on goes to, uh, you know, another investment bank. And then somehow things kind of took a turn. And, you know, one of the things that Isabel and I talk about is like, despite having very different experiences at Barnard, mine being quite linear, um, you know, taking advantage of, of like Barnard in the way that I did and, and having the great time that I did and hers being having a couple more twists and turns, we kind of still ended up at the same place. And that is twin. I love how you just set me up so perfectly what for this. I like I had a linear experience at Barnard. <laughs> um, so I did not have a linear experience at Barnard. I came to New York thinking I wanted one thing. And what subsequently ended up happening was just opening myself up to opportunities and kind of letting life take me. And what that means for me is when I got to Barnard, I studied, I was studying English. I thought I wanted to be a theater major, walked out of those auditions really fast. So I was like, absolutely not. Am I getting up and auditioning in front of everyone that's psychotic? Um, but that's part of the job. And I was like, no, so clearly this isn't for me. And then I was writing and working on English and I loved it. And then we participated in this incredible exhibition at the Guggenheim and it changed my life. I happened to be taking an Art History One seminar and I was like, the world just makes sense yeah. by looking at a painting. I don't know why, but it just totally transformed the way that I thought about the world and the spaces I wanted to inhabit and the communities I wanted to create. And about that time that I started figuring out who I was, I suffered with depression and anxiety in my sophomore and my junior year. And it was very hard. And uh, Columbia and Barnard is such an amazing place yeah. where there are so many academically high achievers. And it's a space that really makes you want to want to achieve great things for yourself. And you're really inspired by your classmates and how thoughtful they are and how forward thinking they are that you want to be that as well. But for me that I wasn't sure what I wanted and coupled, this was 2012, I guess, when this happened. And people were actually not having enough conversations about mental health back then. So there was still a lot of shame and stigmatism around it because as a woman in New York City achieving it all with all of these amazing opportunities before you, how can you fail? And so it's true. And so I was forced to take some time away from Barnard and to really reevaluate, yeah. did I wanna continue? Do I wanna continue to get my education? Is this something that's going to serve me longer term in my career? For me, it was really important to get back to Barnard. And what's so funny is I took time away. I traveled the world. I learned exactly what I wanted to do with my career at the age of 20 and 21. And I think for so many young people, you're expected to figure it out so fast. Totally. And I just didn't. I didn't know. And from there, when we came, when I came back, at that point, things had been really difficult in my relationship with Alicia, totally. and we were hit by a car. I don't know if you know this, Cass, actually. Did you know that we had the car accident? I think you mentioned it briefly once. I mean, this is wild. Well, I mean, anyone that <laughs> spent time in Morningside will know that we were hit on 106 and Broadway, which is kind of like a classic middle of the, it's not middle of the campus, but it's pretty close. And so that accident is actually the thing that brought us back together, brought us back together after kind of having spent 
figuring that yeah. we maybe wanted to go in different career paths. Alicia was going off to work in politics and finance and forge a very different path. And I was still very much figuring it out. I knew where I knew that I wanted to go into fashion at that point, but it didn't know, I didn't know how to connect all of the dots. And then you're saddled with this horrible, horrific accident in which Alicia had emergency brain surgery and I, we both couldn't walk. And it was wild. I would feel like I'd recovered and I'd come to a place where I knew myself. I knew what I wanted. And then I had to stop for six weeks yeah. and just rest. Mm -hmm. And it was in that experience, this life-changing experience that has changed our lives forever. It's, it's like nothing can be worse than getting hit by a car. So let's go <laughs> in, in yeah. some ways too. Or at least it was for us at the time. Yeah. And I ended up going back to Barnard. I finished my degree. It was fantastic. I wrote a thesis and I combined my love of fashion and art and working with the Met because fashion and art are massive at the Met right now. And Andrew Bolton is killing it. That whole department. I love those people. And they really have inspired a new generation of art historians and people interested in art and fashion to create a whole new space for it. And so that's where we find ourselves. Exactly. Thank you both <laughs> for sharing that. No, truly, you know, I think, especially for our, uh, the audience members, right? And there are people listening who are everything from current students to, you know, long into their careers and um, everything you just shared, right? Like not only is it a magical, like I, I, a great story about sisters. I have three sisters of my own. So I know what it's like when you kind of go your own paths and um, when you come back together. So that is just remarkable. I mean, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> the reason that maybe kind of kicked that off. I'm so happy, you know, that you both recovered fully. Um, but also thank you so much for sharing your, your different journeys at Barnard. You know, I think that's really important um, for people to, to know and, and to see, and to your point that it doesn't have to be linear and, you know, taking the time to step back and kind of ask yourself those, who am I, what do I want? Um, is, is really important. So thank I was you. For fortunate. Sharing. I was really fortunate that I had an amazing system around me to allow that. Not everybody has that, but I took advantage of it and I did everything I could to make sure that I set myself up in life so that I was happy, fulfilled, and ultimately able to achieve the things that I knew I wanted. So yeah. it was, it wasn't easy though. It took me 10 years. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Um, really it's, you know, it's a remarkable story. Um, which gets us now to Twin. Um, where did the idea for Twin come from? Was it post this accident? And it, who thought of it? Where did it come from? How did you start creating it? I mean, we're all here today because of Isabella. That's right. just the long and the short of it. Um, I think that like the, the kind of general belief that founded Twin was honestly Isabella and I having a lifelong conversation about imagining the world that we wish existed and then operating just as if it did and pursuing those values really at all costs. And I think having a sister gave, like having each other gave us both the bravery to almost bravery. single-mindedly pursue something that a lot of people thought was crazy. And now fashion brands don't sound like a crazy idea, but twin- They sound sexy and exciting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. As you know, Twin is not only a sustainable brand, but it's also a brand that is inclusive on the basis of size, gender, ability, and frankly speaking, cost and price. So for us, when we were concepting out Twin, it's obviously deeply about the two of us being twins, being sisters. We're sister people. We attract sister people. Unsurprising that we found you and you found us. Yes. Um, <laughs> But in addition to that, the reason TWIN is an acronym for That's What I Need is because it's actually a promise that we make in that we're actually going to think about the values and things that other people need and try our best to do that. And that's kind of where the values that we described kicked off because it was a conversation of, okay, well, what are we going to do? And like, what do we need? And then it was like, oh, well, TWIN is what we need and that's in the name. So therefore, TWIN. Yeah. For me, the reason why I wanted it to be called twin specifically is being a twin is something that is so fundamental to the two of us. And we've been able to definitely, we have this incredible relationship. And because transparently, I asked this 
brilliant entrepreneur academia woman to be my business partner. I approached her. I, I'd always had it in my head that I wanted to work with Alicia on something. And over the years, I have definitely been like, hey, I got this, we've got these ideas and we have these creative projects and we would always work together. But yes, I did have the dream of being in business with my twin. Did not think it would be called twin. Didn't know what it would be called. <laughs> But really the reason why it was, is it's, you know, it's universal enough. You wouldn't believe how many twins there are in the world. So weirdly enough, they're, they're just, it's more, it's more common amongst people than you think. And it's also just this idea of finding your other half. People are very fascinated about what does wholeness look like, or what does community look like? And for us being a twin has been that, just that is, is my, is being mm -hmm. a twin and why, yeah, that, that's basically yeah. why I wanted to call it twin because I it's a love letter to my twin sister. Yeah, I, I love that. And, you know, it's, um, I think as the world, you know, grows, we, we become more connected. We all, we sometimes also become more disconnected. And so being able to, um, you know, create something that truly does have the community in mind and the people you're trying to serve um, versus just creating a product and right. And like, okay, and we'll find a consumer to buy this, but um, doing this value, you know, these values you have and, and then going and creating a company around them. I mean, it is, it's very remarkable. Not everyone can be successful at doing this. And so, um, you know, kudos to you both for really just conceptualizing it, creating it, and sticking to it. And I see it, right? I, I, I've seen it in your store and the people, how you interact in your community. Um, it's really, really beautiful. And I, um, yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, I, you know, yes, we, we, we can get more to some stories later. Um, okay. But why don't we, why don't we also talk a little bit specifically about um, the clothing you create and kind of the, 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 you both are about conscious consumption um, and, and creating products, right, that that truly are sustainable. And we know there that can mean a lot of things. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what that means for twin and how you you really try to integrate that um, into into your creations. So I think like generally speaking, sustainability is like a buzzword. We all know it. We all love it. But what does it actually mean? It means a lot of different things for a lot of different brands. For us, generally speaking, we define sustainability as conscious consumption and production because I think that it encapsulates more the mindfulness aspect on the producer side, and we're manufacturing clothes, to be transparent and to be considerate and to do the research and to build the technology and all of those other beautiful things to make sure that we're as conscious as we can and being as sustainably minded as we can in making the clothes. And on the opposite and reciprocal side of that, considering the ways in which our customers are finding us engaging with the clothes, purchasing the clothes, living with the clothes and all of those great things. And so conscious consumption and mindfulness really, I think do a better job at defining what we're doing. And it's just been like, frankly speaking, amazing and great. And you meet and have amazing conversations. I mean, for us, just to add to what Alicia is saying, for me, it was about creating a maximum impact while like a minimum carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. For us, we're very focused on this idea of, I, and I know we, were, we said it before, I don't know if we said this before, but imagining the world that you wish existed yeah. and operating as it, if it does, is taking the values of what is most important from like a, this is good for general society, and then accepting that this is what you need, and this is how the world can operate. And when you're young and you're smart about it, and you're strategic, you're able to just implement those those thoughts or those values or those techniques earlier on because everyone has already accepted that this is a truth. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I would actually almost describe it as like a by having the value, you almost create a constraint that like we're going to operate this way. And then you basically just have to find the inroads to doing that. So like, just like to give you a, like an overhead of like, well, you already know this, but for everyone else that doesn't, we go from like the beginning, from sourcing the fabrics, we only use dead stock materials. So whether they are synthetic or natural fibers, everything we make is dead stock. What that means is that they are pre-existing in the world. So somebody has already made it or used it, or it was 
part of a larger run. And we would basically taken that fabric that they were unable to sell or utilize, or maybe it's just forgotten. And that is what we turn into our collection. Totally. And then from that standpoint, we also go into how much we manufacture. So we are very careful to produce only as much as we need and really no more. Now that's not an easy thing to do. So we make a very limited quantity of things. And as we're scaling up, that's something that we're constantly iterating and working on. But frankly speaking, it's going well so far. So we're, we're pretty happy about that. But the reason why we've sort of done that and we've controlled how much um, we make of a certain item is that once you've created something, it's the idea that if you really truly want it, you're going to invest your time and your money and you're going to buy it and you're going to love it. And then once it's gone, there's none of the, you, the, that piece is special. There is a limited number of them and you have that knowledge within you. And so there is a, there's a psychological mindset where like people do take care of their things a little bit better when they know that it's special or that there's a scarcity mindset. If there's an abundance of something, people are not going to be as careful with it. Yeah. I mean, the other side of it, like the less sexy part of it is the logistics. We shoot, we ship everything by boat. It takes a long time. It's difficult. It's how we offset our carbon footprint. Even our shipping packaging, like if people order online, which you can, like you can find us online at Twin, you can find us on Instagram, you can find us in our store in Nolita. Um, but the real thing, the real point there is that we, like all of our packaging is either, well, it's all fully, oh, she she's better. Oh, place. I know. Oh, yeah, so yeah, you when we first it. started, when you're creating, when you're creating systems and you're like, you can say like, okay, cool. I'm creating a system. For example, when we wanted to create our shipping and logistics, I, because of the background that I come from, one of the things I was working in is marketing and working with influencers and dealing with packaging. So you're sending huge packages to people with tons of beautiful bows and ribbons and paper. And that's quite terrifying. And so when we were thinking about our shipping and logistics, I wanted to use materials that either could be fully reusable, fully compostable, or like these were recyclable, like, oh God, whatever we were adding to, especially in the pandemic where we yeah. were receiving so many packages and boxes and everything that really gave me a, it gave me that time to think about it. So yeah. basically like to go back to the maximum impact, minimum carbon footprint, like we literally go through every part of the process of manufacturing, shipping, bringing it in, delivering it, everything, and try to make things as sustainable as possible. And we're super transparent with how we do that. So like, if you go onto our website, our sustainability is like one of those that cascades down, like you click a link and it just grows and then you click another <laughs> link and it grows. So, you know, I think for us, as much as there is that the conscious consumption thing for us, it's very important to also be, I mean, we're twins and we're Gemini's communication is key. As much communication and information and storytelling as we can provide, we do. And that's actually one of the best things about being in store with, as Cass will tell you, every piece has a story from why we made it to what inspired it to how it's made. But it should, it should be made yeah, thoughtfully with that intention. Why not? People are so picky about the clothes that they put on their body. Should be. Like, why not, why not answer some of those questions? If not all of them. Totally. Yes. So I completely agree. And I, I love that you're explaining all of this in detail because I think, you know, there, there's always this kind of over this, this narrative out there that, um, well, if you want to be sustainable or if you want to be values driven, if you want to be conscious about the way you're doing business, it, though, that and like having a profitable business or like those models don't coexist, but they do. They just take a little extra thought, right? Maybe a little extra time, um, but it's very possible. And so, you know, you guys are a great example of that. You can do both and be profitable um, and, and have fun, right? Um, fun. So, so I, mean, I do think I will say this just overarchingly, Cass. Yeah. I think that there is like a view of capitalism that's winner take all. And I think that that's like great. And it's the, in some ways, it's a version of the American dream that's like really important. And I, we, we're, you know, we're running a business at the end of the day and that's part of it, but there is a way to also run a business and be conscious and mindful about what you're putting out and building into the world. And like tons of rocks of twin on sale is just not the vision. It's why we don't go on sale as you well know. So it's kind of one of those things where to your point, if you imagine the world looks a certain way and then you just operate as if it does, it doesn't mean you can't have some flexibility or be profit minded or be business minded. It just, it's about, again, how conscious and mindful you're doing the things you're doing to be profitable. But I think also which comes into conscious consumption and sustainability is also thinking about compassion and like the ways in which we are trying to reconnect with our humanity. 
And part of that is being kind to the ways in which we have to retrain our brains into modes of thinking that have, there are systems that have been in place for hundreds of years. So we're, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's so that is that is definitely a thread I want to pull on a little bit later. Um, is kind of like how do you educate your your customers, right? Before we jump to that one, I would love to. So now that we really know the background of how you source everything and how hands on you are with it, um, Isabella, I know you're kind of the designer of the two. So um, how does so how do you now as a creative person, right, and the designer? Um, how, what's your process? Like, how do you find the dead stock first? And then you're like, okay, this is a great color. I like it. I'm going to create something with it. Take us a little bit down the, the creative process. I am a very selfish woman. <laughs> That's okay. So it like that. starts with me because <laughs> I, how I came. She's a selfish, but honest woman. I'm a I guess. selfish, but honest person. Self-aware. Self-aware. Hey, I'm just being honest. But what I'm trying to get to the point of that is I started with myself. I'm a curvy woman. I'm between a size 16 and an 18. I don't fit in straight size. I have a very difficult time shopping in store. I have become a super sleuth shopper. I have a whole system and it's psychotic. And there's a certain point at which there are so many people like me who feel like they have to hack the system or figure it out. And people are so overwhelmed by all of this information that they're being given that for me, it was like, okay, what do I need? What do I want? What do I want to wear? And so it started with asking those questions. And I think that that's where it always should come from is like, it has to start from something that you think is useful and that you would need. And then you have to hope that everyone is also going to need this thing. And nine times out of 10, they do. So I start with myself and I have a lot of issues. I have boobs. I have big arms. I would I have say consideration, I have not fun. issues. <laughs> Assets. Assets. Yeah. We but love the brain. Yes. That's what sisters are for. <laughs> can, you can hear my like coded, you know, trained yeah. body dysmorphia training yeah. coming out. Woo, I haven't worked in fashion for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> built an environment that was supportive of your values. Truly. So for, for me, because I have all of these curves and swerves and bumps and lumps, I, when I start with, when I'm creating something, I'm like, okay, it has to look good on me. And I have a, and I have what I would call like a very curvy, swervy body. Whereas when I would look at Alicia, who is a typical size six, two and eight, I mean, granted, she's got curves and swerves and lumps and bumps, but oh my God. Okay. But (laughs) for, it was, it was interesting to think of the ways in which I was working with people who um, clothing and shopping was very easy for them. And also looking and working with people who clothing and shopping was very difficult for them. Yeah. I would like to add one thing. I think that like, again, our approach comes from our own experiences with clothing. But one of the things that actually came out of like having a store and taking our product out into the world was meeting people. And like, genuinely speaking, everyone feels a kind of way. I've never met someone that for whom shopping was like easy, chill vibe, no problem. Like what I'm describing to you is a daily occurrence at twin. Exactly. And so like, I think starting with your own considerations and not seeing those met by the marketplace or not seeing them met with all the values that we have in terms of sustainability or affordability is another really big one. We kind of, I think like Izzy specifically was like, this is what I need to do. But for instance, like little things came out of it. Like, well, that's where it started. But totally. Then but then what's... like when you were, when we were, for instance, like with gender inclusion, which is like a big, big thing for twin. Um, one of the things that we noticed off the bat was that when, when Isabella was picking early styles for the collection, she was looking into her closet and, and I had a that, lot of menswear. Yeah. Gender, like when you yeah. shop vintage or when you shop in the real world, like you borrow your parents' clothing, you take your dad's blazer, you take your mom's skirt and you put it together and so for us, we never really saw, I mean, really like never is, mind borrowed from the boys. I just went there, took it for myself and put it on my body. And now like, it is mine. And clothes <laughs> don't have gender. So our version of like, you know, we call it gender inclusion as opposed to gender neutral as an example, because we see gender neutral as neutralizing the experience of gender into a specific look versus the twin approach, which is like, if you're going to play with all the colors, like play with all the colors. Like if you want to, when we shoot, for instance, like in our campaigns, we'll take photographs of like skirts, dresses, pants, blazers on everybody, male, female, non-binary presenting bodies and giving people the permission by seeing a model in whatever piece they want. It, it almost like opens the door for other people to see themselves in that reality and again that's just part of the twin thing like imagine the world you wish existed and then just like make it so um 
I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure Isabella has like 800 examples oh, of like how that's the case. It's true. So I mean, I, like truly with going back to me because I'm numero, oh no, my God, I, this is so ridiculous. Love it. <laughs> there are just things that when you, ha when you're forced or when you have the space to think about it and you have time, the ways in which clothes fit and look and make you feel are so, so important. And so as much as it is a physical thing that we're selling, I'm trying to like, you're, you're dealing with people's feelings and emotions and how they feel about themselves and the identity that they're, they're trying to project forward. So it's, it's exciting. I mean, like, just like one really, like, it's an example that we, I mean, sweater weather is about to be upon us. So it is worth yeah. mentioning. I'm actually wearing it. For instance, Izzy has eczema. So when we, I mean, you know this, cause again, you've been in the store, so you know, but <laughs> our fabrications are insanely soft and hypoallergenic. So we call our fabric skin friendly because mm -hmm. when you see a top online, you don't know how it's going to feel. When you see like a sweater, you kind of think, oh, is it going to be scratchy or is it going to itch me? Isabella can't wear it if it's not absolutely the softest fabrication. And so because she's designing it, that is built into things. And we have people who come in who literally say, I have never been able to buy a turtleneck for the winter because of my psoriasis or my eczema. And now I can finally cover up to my neck and you watch them. It, there's like this moment of I th like recognition where somebody sees that you identified what they need and you made it. It's like the most, I've run a lot of different startups that moment of like recognition and connection between us and our community members is like so intoxicating and so it's the best part of the whole thing a hundred percent knowing some people come in and they're so scared and so afraid or they're they already have an I'm already listening attitude and having people come in and it's like they walk through one rack they start touching things you introduce yourself That's like familiar yep and, and <laughs> there's like you just start I just start talking about the things that I'm interested in and immediately you just, I mean, I brought people to tears and I'm like, it's okay. I'm like, I know how you're feeling. I felt the same way. You're here now. We can do this. And it's nice. It's, it's nice to, to feel as empowered as I feel about what I'm doing. I know that people are equally empowered by what we're doing. And that's the thing that keeps us going. Totally. Yeah. So that is a great segue to talk about the community you all have built. I mean, it's, you know, you can tell you, you both are at it. Who wouldn't want to talk to the both of you? And if we, you know, I mean, we've, you know, actually, I, you know, how, how we actually came to know each other is about three or three or four years ago, we were both at the same kind of like art opening gallery or something and I saw you I saw you both you just like walked by me and Isabella was in this like gorgeous like burgundy pants like crop top blazer and I was like I I stopped you and I was like excuse me like this outfit is like you look amazing and and she's like oh I I made it it's my brand and I was like what and so you know immediately started following you and it wasn't until years later we actually realized we had the Columbia connection which amazing Colombians are out there everywhere um but instantly we became you know we chatted for maybe a minute or two and here we are all these years later and that's just like the energy you both have so how I mean I, it's probably not a mystery to our audience after listening to you for just 30 minutes but let's talk a little bit about how community does how you really do foster uh the community around twin I mean around yourselves, but around twin and, um, how it's, you know, perhaps contributed to the, to the growth of your brand. I think like one of the things that's really, it's funny because now we have a community, but when we started, we did not, we, I mean, we had our Barnard community. We had our friends, like I had, we, Isabel had her art friends and I had my finance friends and I had and my fashion friends, fashion friends yeah. are great too. <laughs> you know, all these people yeah. that we you know, have in our, in our lives and who make our lives richer every day. And but some friends support and some don't, yeah. or they, or, you know, you never know. So totally. Well, we've talked about this in that, like, sometimes, I mean, it's hard for people so to tough. accept some versions of you. I mean, this is, 
I mean, like reading a physical product, you I mean, also, there's got to be a level of distrust at the beginning. Well, and you also read, you see, touch and feel, you, you know read now. our bios, like we're kind of the most Gemini, Gemini twins ever <laughs> that like, I mean, again, if anyone that's listening to this has any questions about running a tech startup or working in investment banking or transitioning from law into, you know, a venture capital backed business or building a consulting model business, like I'm here for that and can absolutely and will absolutely answer any and all questions that you have about like VC raises or funding questions or any of that like nitty gritty stuff, which is like my favorite thing to talk about aside from twin. But we both came from these like diverse backgrounds and then people had to reframe their vision of what we were and how we operated in the world and see twin as like the, the real thing that we're working on and the community that we're building. And so for us, it was like, we started online and what the minute that we got out into the real world and like we're at pop-ups in Williamsburg or Greenpoint or the Upper West Side or every other place we, I mean, Muscatine, Iowa, Florida, California. I mean, we we go, we take the show on the road. It was amazing to see people like, I mean, one of my favorite stories ever, which Isabella might be a little mad at me for telling, is we have an incredible wholesale customer in Muscatine, Iowa, whom we absolutely adore. Her name is Candy, Candy Fugan, amazing. And anyone in Iowa should go to her store. It's called Live Leo Apparel. And she was a customer of ours that found us at, in Williamsburg. And like talking about community, we she invited us to Muscatine to be part of like her store opening and a fundraiser. And she put on a twin fashion show that was also a fundraiser for the local dog shelter. And mm -hmm. Isabella had to watch people in a town she had never been to before, people she didn't know, wearing twin in the world and being inspired by our values mm -hmm. she was totally like stone-faced she couldn't function it's very it's it's in, it's very even it's it's funny that you mentioned that I said that I made the piece for it was interesting when you create something to own that you have done something and to be proud of it and Wow. Yeah, it's I am a designer and I, I made these outfits and it, it's very it's a very surreal thing to say, but I'm very proud of it. But for instance, like we're here today because we have the most incredible community ever. Like right. imagine that like you met us years ago and we're like, I think this is amazing and I think you need to be heard. And here's mm -hmm. a way that I can, you know, I can embrace you and share this message with you and share it with the world. I mean, that's our dream is to share the values that we have which are kind of imbued into our products with as many people around the U S and the world as possible. So it's, you know, it was kind of this moment of like when we took the show on the road and the more we started meeting people and talking and the community just answered back and it's what's allowed us to grow. I mean, I mentioned venture capital raise, raises. We are a self-funded business. Amazing. And I mean, truly. But and it took somebody who's been an entrepreneur for a long time to come to such a difficult decision to even do that. Mm -hmm. But I do want to go back to the, yeah. the community yeah. aspect of it. So one of the ways that we do build community, or I guess it sort of found itself, it's a self-selecting group because, well, where we've been in, where we put ourselves is in two various, like, you know, wonderful places. We were originally in Williamsburg in Regeneration and Artists and Fleas, which is an amazing space that brings together makers from all over New York City and Brooklyn and the tri-state area. And you meet so many other business owners okay. through that. And that in itself, meeting other entrepreneurs and other business owners who were doing not only similar things to what we were doing, but also different was incredible but in addition to that once people met us experienced the clothes what started to happen uh, is that people obviously have a lot of thoughts about the way things should be made you people do have a, a lot of opinions for example like the dress the dress you're wearing yes I'm wearing this beautiful navy dress I wish you could see the whole thing it's a floor length dress I love it so well, we're gonna get the the burgundy color back maybe Oh, okay. you know, what's so funny. Like we totally <laughs> cannot find that fact. Well, dead stock. Exactly. Like, we've right. been trying and Good we just point. can't find it more of that color. Yes. It's so funny you say. Oh, buy it when you see it. I did not buy the burgundy one and I still think about it a year later. So 
there are, there are certain, lesson learned. <laughs> oh no, there are certain pieces and fabrics that when somebody comes and they ask me for that thing, my heart just sinks to my stomach and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I do feel genuinely devastated when we can't give people what yeah. they need because I would love to be able to offer more, but you have to create a cap on what is created or yeah. else people yeah. sort of have this expectation that it can go on and on and on. And that that defeats the purpose. Yeah. But I think your point about for, like for this, yeah. for this particular dress. So this is actually a generation two dress of the first ever dress that I designed at twin. How it came about was we created this phenomenal bias cut, like um, spaghetti strap dress that just, it hits. It's amazing. When I say it hits, it's just like, it doesn't it's matter. The, it's the rose one that you have. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Really I have gotten that. into it. Alicia's getting into the customer profile <laughs> sorry, here. Sorry, sorry. I remember, I remember everything. Like, honestly. So, yeah. <laughs> from that, we actually, one of our best friends was like, I was like, I oh, went to she, Barnard with us. I went to Barnard with us. She loved the dress, the spaghetti strap version. She was like, Izzy, I love you, but I will not wear something without like thicker straps. I need to be able to wear a bra. I need to know that I'm covered. I need the security. If you make it this way, I will get it. And so I did. And thus, thus it exists. And it became, yep. it was something that it was an innovation that I hadn't necessarily thought of myself because it wasn't a concern that I had about my needs in terms of dressing, but it was somebody else's concern. Yep. And it was to the point of being someone else's concern that this dress, we, it's yeah. scary. And that's amazing. I mean, I don't know what other clothing line brand designer I could share that type of feedback with and they would instantly be like all right yeah let's design something for you that is comfortable and fits your body and you know I mean that it's it's you know you get your inspiration from your community um and do something with it which yep. is really wonderful um so I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions then we can turn to the audience um, I would love to, and you just, you actually gave a really wonderful example in Candy in Iowa. Um, but uh, as this is, you know, she opened the door, we um, love to particularly highlight, you know, women uh, on our platforms. Um, so I'd love to, you know, if you have anything to share or talk about, maybe about how um, women in particular have helped, you know, contribute to um either twin or, you know, other thing, other, you know, other way, other things along your journey um, yeah. and pathways. I mean, I think one of the things that I, it, it kind of goes into how twin is expanding, but it actually is more about like what we were talking about related to like how the U S like cap, when people think about entrepreneurs, basically, when you think about like American capitalism, you think about like Jeff Bezos, you know what I mean? You're like, this guy did it. He's doing things. But actually, as we've been expanding twin, we've realized that the backbone of American retail is not big retailers. Like they are definitely important. And there's absolutely no question about their value in terms of giving people access but a lot of the small businesses in small towns across America, specifically like retail businesses, are family run, traditionally women led businesses. And so in the process of actually building out Twin, we've been developing these incredible relationships with women like Candy. And there's other people across the country that I could name literally because I talk to them so frequently <laughs> who are so incredible and are pillars of their community and who are keeping they basically go out into the world to places like New York, but to, you know, cities all over across America, find designers and brands with values like ours. And then they bring them back to their communities and say, this is what we discovered. And this is what we want to share with you. And it's one of the, th I mean, if our dream is for the twin values of inclusion and conscious consumption to be as many places as possible, these people and these businesses are the vessels for that. And they're actually the people doing the hard work. And so it's been amazing to see just truly how the fabric of the American economy is so empowered and powered by women and that we're just one part of that. And of course, big cities like New York, you are kind of spoiled for choice. You can have like very specific criteria about how you want your products, why you want them, all sorts of things. But when you go back into smaller towns in America, there really aren't as many options. And so these people are just these women are doing this incredible work and sharing, for instance, our message and the twin mes message with their friends or community members. It's just like the most fun thing ever. And like, 
you know, shout out to them for really just, I mean, being incredible. And it's, you know, it's funny. It's, it wasn't something that I or Isabella totally considered. Didn't anticipate or expect it, but yeah. Yeah. Well, you attract a wonderful community. You've yeah. built a wonderful community. Um, what's next? What's on the horizon for twin? And maybe what, what do you have the ultimate goal? Is it kind of one step, you know, one foot in front of the other right now? What's next? I think to a certain point we're it's, it's hard. I mean, because we're value-based and we're focused on conscious consumption and putting in all these values, you know, for us, we're trying to figure out the best way to spread our message to as many as, as many people as possible without alienating them. Totally. So it's a bit like, Oh, what's that thing you say? That's like so good. It's about the vegetables. I'm always like put the broccoli and the mac and cheese. Like, you know, uh, when you put vegetables in something yeah. to make it a little bit healthier, but it's still yeah. good. Like yeah. there's still cheese and there's still bread, but this broccoli is not so terrible in it as well. It actually makes it a little better. Yeah. So that's how we try to think about it is like, how do you make something accessible, cute, fun, worth it, but that also, you know, does speak to who you are as a person and the things that, you know, makes you tick. I mean, it's funny because you asked us this question and the very obvious answer is like, we're launching our first ever tote bag in like a few days. Oh. That's Isabella designed the shit out of it excuse my french <laughs> incredible and it's made of upcycled greenhouse garden tarp and that sounds crazy but it's sounds amazing it's cool it's I, I cannot I wait to see it months months. no you're gonna love it and so will everyone else and so yeah. like that's coming up next week and then we have our fall launch so we have an entire collection that isabella designed that is going to be launching mm -hmm. in a few days so you know that's happening but yeah. I think like on the grander level, like what Isabella's kind of, and you know, I think like more wholesale customers because more people telling the great message of twin. And, you know, yeah. we would love to do like a collaboration with someone that has the reach, because I think one of the things that, you know, New York has been amazing at is like, we get people from all over the world who come into our store when they're visiting New York and they get a, a very authentic experience as we've been living in New York for 15 years, despite being Canadian. So they're really getting a New York business. Um, <laughs> But at the same time, they're getting a sense of like what we are trying to build and their message and they're bringing it home with them. So like doing things, more things that would allow us to tell the message to a bigger and broader audience is definitely something that we're doing. But like even for instance, like we launched a YouTube show um, a few weeks ago, we kind of soft launched it. That's all around. It's kind of like what not to wear, but it's Isabella and I, instead of telling people how they suck at fashion, it's actually <laughs> asking people what they would never wear and asking if they'll let us try to change their minds. Oh, but you would love it. Like, it's really cute. Yeah. So, Can you give us a little sneak peek? What are, what are, what's one of the examples perhaps well, so over to the YouTube channel? <laughs> the next one that we're doing is actually around somebody who has particularly large boobs, but actually loves to accentuate them and finding yeah. ways to do that in a way that feels, you know, structured and empowering and doesn't feel like, you know, uncomfortable or too revealing. Yeah. And so we actually style different outfits of twin and let them compete. We can actually compete to see who's they, whose outfit they like better. Oh, that's so fun. I love that. A little friendly sister, you know, competition. <laughs> Keeps it interesting. Alicia, is, Alicia and I are a little bit competitive. And I think that's why we're constantly thinking about innovation and pushing each other to move forward because there's a, there's a healthy little bit of, of competition that kind of keeps, keeps the edge on things. Right? Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. like, just as like the, you know, to bring it back to conscious consumption and sustainability, Isabella and I are constantly looking for more ways to improve our use of sustainable technologies and materials. And literally Isabella's favorite hobby is like, Ooh, this new sustainable or plant-based fabric came out. Like we should try it. So I, you know, for us, it's also about innovating and even pushing the needle forward on how we can be more conscious and more sustainable and those types of things. So you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of also what we're working on. I'm going to also yeah. say just to back Ooh. it up, go for it. We have been in business for only three oh, yeah. years. 
I'm like, I'm sure you want us to do all these innovative, crazy, cool things, but I'm not over here growing a new type of fabric. I'm just trying to find ways to utilize what's in existence true, to true, us true, 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 so true. we can be smarter about the ways in which we live, so live our lives. It's all, sometimes it's not about like making a big splash. Totally, it's totally. about looking at the already existing system and figuring out the ways in which we can reframe it. Totally. So true. I don't know what a lot of those are going to be, but when you, when you're starting out, you're just like, let's just stay alive and make sure that people like this. Yes. And we're finally now at a place where we can have these kinds of conversations. We can say who we are, what we're trying to achieve, what we've been, what we have achieved thus far, which has been great, but it's, the options are endless. Yeah. And what's great about the twin community is that the more people that walk through the door and the more people we meet and have these kinds of conversations, the closer we'll get to sort of understanding what the future looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a question in the chat and I think I'll pair it with actually another question because um, they, they can kind of go together. Um, yeah. but kind of picking up um, on the thread, uh, pun intended, <laughs> uh, someone is asking, um, they'd love to hear, you know, a little bit more about um, how you how you're looking out for these new dead stock materials or, you know, new sustainable materials. Um, so how you're finding those. And then the the second question I'm just going to kind of attach onto this um, is going back to the, uh, how important educating your consumers are and, or it is your community. They're already educated when they come to you. Is that maybe that's how they find you. Um, but yeah, so if you can touch on those two things, that'd be great. So as far as the research on fabric question, that's really an Isabella question. But one thing that I love to kind of talk about in terms of like education is like, if the clothes are not cute, people don't care how many values you have. So like, that sounds really like harsh, but like, it is ultimately reality. True. Yeah. So for us, the kind of broccoli and the macaroni and cheese thing is like, we are educating people once they've bought into how cute things are we initially when we started did the opposite and we were like why is nobody listening to all the great values and education we have and we found that that approach just overloaded people so now we kind of like we're like it's a party come join and then they're like okay and then we're like also everything in here is made from dead stock material and they're like oh really and you can feel really yeah. good about having a limited edition you know consciously and ethically made piece and so for us, I, learning the kind of approach of like actually how to educate people has been like once we started figuring out that like being friendly and open was actually a great segue into education and teaching people about the values, we kind of like we're like, okay, cool, like this is actually yeah. the right way. So that's how we do it now. Approachable and non-judgmental. I think so. Oh, yeah. Smart. And it seems so obvious, but until yeah <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to I don't know if this has been uh, mentioned at all we are from Canada mm -hmm. so there is something about um being Canadian and being nice whether or not that's true we definitely yeah. do take it to heart and we try to apply that to people who come in because they're not they're they're coming in for a discovery for an experience and kindness is really just the way you approach things yeah and the research and fabric question is like Isabella's constantly so, researching yeah. So I went to Barnard. You think I don't research? Come on. <laughs> That's where it's coming from. It's like, yeah. it's all, it's like a beautiful mind. I don't know how else to describe it. I re I'm constantly, I'm always listening. I'm always looking. I'm always doing research and the research can come from, I'm going to fabric shows. I'm looking at what other people are doing. I'm reading a ton of materials yeah. about innovation and fashion and fashion business. There are so many great resources. I mean, the best thing that you can just start to do if you're looking for those kinds of resources is just asking the right questions. Yeah. What do you have available? Totally. What, where, what is, what is working for you? What isn't working? And you, with me, with the fabrics in particular, I get swatches. So I get, I either will go and I'll meet with different factories and I'll say, Hey, what do you have? What can I see? Or if I'm creating a specific, so for example, when I was creating the perfect t-shirt or the perfect shirt, there were specific criteria that I was looking for in the fabric that I wanted. And so I would go and I looked at different brands that I loved, that I didn't love, tried on a whole bunch of yeah. them. And I took all of that research and I, and I like sat down with it and crafted what I was looking for. Yeah. 
and figured it out and then went out and did my research about my fabrics. And it's just constantly yeah. innovating and changing and working on it. There's, there's no secret sauce. You just have to, you just have to do your research. It's the things that they taught us at Barnard and Columbia are still relevant today. And the number one thing I always see people is like, do your research. 100%. It's the best. Um, well, I am really sad to say we're already at an hour, which is crazy. We could talk for a whole nother hour or even beyond, um, So thank you both so, so much for sharing your journey, sharing your, you know, experience creating twin. Um, You're making me, I'm like, I want to create a business with my sisters. (laughs) Um, Let me know. Okay, great. Um, But, you know, I think for those listening, right, I think what I would also take away from this is just having an amazing co-founder. I mean, it's very clear just throughout the conversation today, you can kind of see who takes on which roles, um, but how you complement each other so well. So um, thank you for you know, all the entrepreneurs, the sustainable fashion folks out there. Um, please, please follow and um, get in touch. Um I would also like to thank the She Opened the Door Committee and the Columbia Alumni Association for helping make today's session possible. Um, So please, if you would like, please connect with us here on LinkedIn. Um, Also, Alicia and Isabella here are offering, you can find them at twin.nyc, also um, on Instagram, all the social channels. Um, but they are so, so generously offering a discount to uh, Columbia people listening in. So like you said, nothing nothing ever goes on sale. So this is like a super treat. So definitely use this. Um, and to the audience, thank you for joining us and, you know, for your questions. Um, we're so excited to kick off year two of Ask the Expert. And, you know, we hope you will also consider volunteering and getting involved at the CAA. And lastly, um, do mark your calendars, save the date. We already have our next two Ask the Expert uh, sessions planned, one on Friday, October 26th, and the next on Friday, November 22nd. Um, So once again, Alicia, Isabella, thank you so, so much um, for joining us today and wishing everyone a wonderful start to the fall. That sweater weather, Alicia, I'm going to go buy your sweater right now. I love it. It's so funny. I mean, come by. We're we're there you know pretty much seven days a week. Yeah, so 219 Mott Street. You can find us there seven days a week. We're really passionate. <laughs> thank you both. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye.